I'm Ricardo. Uh, I've been leading the 3GS project for around 14 years at this point. Uh, the project has had so far like around almost 2,000 contributors. And one thing that I find interesting is that we really never really had any roadmap for the project. It's all kind of based, it's kind of like community lead. Like I kind of said, you know, I, I guide a little bit, but in general, we don't, we tr everyone is trying to do what they, what they think it should be done. Uh, if you're curious to see how such a project looks like, like how organization looks like, uh, uh, Ren Yuan did a visualization of the Git for, uh, repo for the last 14 years. Uh, and you will see like on the, on the center, like this is basically me on the center, like this little ball is moving around, like moving, moving files, the files are on the circles, the, the, file is, uh, the files are like uh, on the edges. And like for the few, uh, few first few years, it was pretty much just me, like, you know, keep working and some people will like join, uh, join me, like, you know, and then trying to help on some of the parts, but there's a lot of like little, you know, all those little dots is just people that are helping for like fixing this thing, fixing this thing, and you know, like, and I really enjoy the the, the fact that we have we give this opportunity to anyone that you know, you just you want to fix this thing is pretty easy to jump in and like, fix that thing and like you know, compared to like you know not having to some of the like bigger projects that like if they were required to do you know sign contracts and things like that. So after like 14 years, it kind of looks like this. It's a bunch of like people that are main contributors, but there's a lot of people that are like helping, helping a lot. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction, or like a little bit of like background too. Like uh, originally, like this is actually longer than 14 years ago. I started doing like 3D uh, engine work, like exploring this like in Flash already in like 2006, 2007. And like, kind of was working on that for a few years until you know there was like a, when we started to see that there was the HTML5 and we we're gonna like move into that. So I actually started to port the, the code that I had to HTML5 to, and I was actually using SVGs for rendering it because SVG was similar to what Flash was using for rendering 3D. And believe it or not, like we were. I was basically like creating a new SVG every frame. I was deleting all the nodes and adding all the nodes for all the triangles. But you know, for I think at the time you could only do like 2,000 triangles or something like that. To um, like a scene with the only like 2,000 polygons, it would be a bit too difficult already for for the CPU. Uh, then we had like Canvas 3D and like you know, and it seemed is is a much better like option for it, uh, but still it's not the most optimal. And then, like in 2011, we had like what uh, we got WebGL on browsers, which is you know what you want to use. Like your computer has like a GPU, you want to use your GPU for doing 3D. Uh, I'm going to show like you know you can go to the website to see some of the uh, projects that people have been doing. Uh, I should try. I'm supposed to update this. Uh, I'm two years late for updating like you know the latest projects, but I want to. One of my favorites is this uh, Japanese company that really went like all overboard on all the things that you can do with it. So, you know, this is just a normal website. Like this is the, you know, introduction. You can move around, like, you know, play with the things. And go to the next section. Now like the, you know, the animal is becomes refractive. Go to the next section. Like, you know, it's more like a informative in a very like trippy way, I guess. In this section, you can like you know move the um, pen around and draw draw onto the floor, and eventually like the animal just flies away. This to me like really like brings a lot of like you know the kind of creativity that people or the kind of words that we used to see with Flash. Which there's always going to be the battle of like the people saying like, but this is not useful and this is like boring. So you know. Uh, I still go with the kind of like more like pretty things and more like experimental things. Uh, and for like that's mostly like um, plain JavaScript. There's also like if you're used to, you're used to using your uh, frameworks. There's uh, for React there is a React tree fiber which also like being, brings all the component kind of like approach from React and make it much more uh, it's much more easy for for. People like you don't have to learn that much of like how things work, how to connect things. You can just connect things like much, uh, put things together much easily. Uh, for Vue.js, there is also the Trace.js, C 
similar approach. Um, idea. It would be nice if there was an easier way to, like, you know, for all of them to be able to reuse components. But it's a similar idea. Like, there is basically it's kind of a dialect of the language that we had on JavaScript, but like, you know, in um, in every in different flavor. And if you use Velt, it's also like Threlt, uh, which is same same thing. It's just all using the same. Kind of like some of the, the code that we have done on the base, but like some of them, they also they do their own components and their own work to make things much much easier. Um, and if you're more into like no code kind of thing, there is a popular one which is uh, Spline, which is also like using 3JS underneath, and it's pretty it's pretty good tool for um, uh, creating any sort of prototypes and like you know for more designers to play with. Um, there is also, more recently, like um, uh, Gareth has been working on uh, Path Tracer. Um, for those of you that don't know, what like this is more of basically a, like a way of in, not not focused on, on real time, but like is more similar to Blender or like any 3D software like Maya, where you're able to render uh, like a scene in a way that looks much more realistic. Um, but the idea is that it basically uses the same, like, you know, tries to use the API as much as possible. So you're, if you, right now your project has a scene that you, you, you're defining, like, you know, a good example for this is if you're doing, like, a, a furniture shop or, like, something that you want, like, the person to, like, customize uh, the furniture, and you want them to be able to see in a more realistic way how the, uh, is, how the furniture is going to look like, then you can use this for, like, doing a slower, like, kind of lower render. So if you have your, any kind of scene that you have done, well, like in three, you can also like now add this, um, basically, where you can see like this, this path tracer. And instead of rendering with a normal render, you render with this. And then basically allows you to do like, you know, like the first scene, the, what, the first what you see is, is without it. And then like, then progressively, like just gets more realistic. So a better, better example is this one. Uh, so anytime that you move this to the camera, like you can see, like it's a real time. It basically is WebGL render like running. Uh, but whenever you you stop the camera, then the the path tracer like starts working and tries to make the scene more realistic. Well, that's good. That's probably a good shot. Yeah. Also, like makes the background like it has depth of field. There's a bunch of like all the self shadowing is more in general is more realistic than not what you can do in real time at this point. Is another example where on this one we, we can really like play with all the. It, it actually like offers a lot of parameters of like how much um, you want the, the the light to bounce in the object and like the reflection, like all the all different parameters. Uh, yet another example is uh, if I find it, octopus T, I think. So this is real time. And now it becomes a path tracing one. But yeah, this is the kind of thing that we can do now in the browser. If you want an easier way to try, like there's a 3 js editor. Uh, so let's see, we can do maybe a box and a sphere. If I get the box. I'll make it turn it into a plane, something like this. To be able to see, we can see that it's basically, right now we have this sphere with this, and, uh, which is sitting on top of the um, box. So we turn this to realistic. Right now it doesn't, uh, it just, because there is no light or there's nothing, it's not gonna, um, we're not gonna see anything, but it will select the sphere. And we change the material to emissive colors. We add em emission to it. it. Means that like the, the sphere itself is going to emit color on whatever is around it. We can also add like another. I don't know. Maybe a torus knot. Oh, this is a little bit tricky. Did it zoom in too much? Where am I? There you go. 
And then from here, you can actually save that as an image. And basically, you have a little blender in the browser at this point. And yeah, this is this code that anyone can reuse for their project for whatever you, you want to use. So this is a bit like what we have been like so we had so far, like you know, the kind of work that people are doing, the kind of frameworks people have been building on top, uh, like to the point that we even have like path tracers uh, available for websites. Uh, and now we have a since about last year, WebGPU became available on Chrome. It's still not available on Safari. All the browsers are like Firefox, but uh, we are confident that it's going to like you know maybe not this year for Safari, I guess, but like maybe like next year. Um, for WebGPU, basically WebGPU is a different um, API underneath for uh, for doing 3D on the web. Uh, is more is basically on top of Metal, uh, Metal, Vulkan, and DirectX 12. There are basically AP, like native APIs that are more optimized for the current hardware that we have these days. Like WebGL is based on OpenGL, which is, was designed in the late 90s, something like that. So this is basically like a new, like more modern approach to doing 3D, but like basically it's very different to OpenGL, so it requires to do like a new backend for it. So for the last few years, we've been working in like, you know, uh, Mugen and like Sunak and Renault have been working on a, a new render for, for the library. So, and the idea is like, the idea is to, the only thing that you had to do is like basically a, instead of doing a WebGL render, we used to do like WebGL render class, we use a WebGPU render class. Um, we have like a bunch of examples already. We've been working for a lot, quite a few years trying to um, try to have the same parity, like the same, uh, to be able to be, uh, how this com backwards compatible to what the things that we support with WebGL, which is a lot of them. Uh, we're not going to be able to support everything, but like we, yeah, you can have, you can see like a lot of the things that we we have so far. Um, one of the things, um, like the idea, the idea is to try to make it uh, so you only replace the render and then it works straight away. Um, and but at the same time. If we had that, like, you know, we don't want people to have to do like, a, oh, you know, like if you do a website, you don't want to have to have two different renders and saying like, if it's WebGPU, it's available, use this one, other one is use the other one. So we we actually trying to also have a WebGL2 fallback, uh, fallback on the WebGPU render, so you only you can start using the same code, and you don't even have to worry if like if it if Safari supports WebGPU yet, we're gonna try to make it work using the WebG, WebGL2 fallback. Uh, again, not everything is going to be able to work, but like, the idea is that for most of the things, you know, if you're not doing something super specific, it should, it should work. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that you know, like one of the things that we're not able to support is that OpenGL has, uh, like WebGL has GLSL for like for shading language, its own shading language, and and WebGL, um, WebGPU has the W, like I guess it's pronounced Weasel, WGSL. Which there are basically like different languages. Like you, you cannot easily. I, you could maybe have a compiler on your website that compiles like GLSL to Weasel, but that will be a minimum. Like right now, I think the last compiler size was like a one megabyte, which that will that's too much for a website. So something that Sunak has been working on is like a, a new yet another shading language uh, called TSL. Which is basically like a node-based uh, JavaScript uh, shader abstraction. So in the same way that 3JS was making an abstraction for OpenGL to make OpenGL like or WebGL like to make it easy to use, like TSL is trying to make like uh, shaders themselves easier to use and easy to combine with other things. Because right now it's very difficult to you do one shader and another shader is very you cannot easily combine them. Um, so this language basically like generates GLSL or Weasel depending of the you know if you're using WebGPU it's going to generate Weasel otherwise it's going to generate GLSL. Uh, it also going to allow it make it is much easier to make like custom materials. Like a good example is this one. Like on this one we have basically two textures. We have a, a color map there, 
and a detail map. So the idea is that you have a, a material that has a co like a color texture, but you want to add like a, another. You want to multiply another texture on top of the color to make it more interesting. Like to not make not make it. You know, especially if you think of a game. Usually you have like some sh shades of color on a on a Zelda or something like this, and then you add like another texture on top that kind of adds some roughness on, on everything. So it seems not that simple. So for this, like this is the code that will do that. Like you, you use a, this kind of like the node material. You use this color map texture and you multiply this detail on it. And this is all like JavaScript based. Like and we don't have to write like a string anymore, like the you know GLSL or Weasel. For comparison, this is if we want to do the same thing with what we have up until now, it will be this. Like in order to modify like a built-in material, this is the kind of code that we had to do. And you know, it's going to be interesting to see how how people are able to, able to combine these things, and like more like you know, the kind of materials that people are going to be able to do with this. It also um, is going to allow us to do the tree shaking. Like up until now, if all the built-in materials have shaders that we were not able to tree shake uh, whenever you build a website, because anyone is going to be able to create any material at any point. And the shaders need to be there, but like now, like now we are able to to know exactly which nodes you're using and which which code we should be generating, or which code we should be able to, you know, it's all JavaScript based basically. And it's also going to allow um, procedural textures in a much more easy way. Like a good example, like I saw today, there was like uh, this uh, uh, this guy was doing like. Uh, what he's calling like TSL textures, which one of the interesting things with this is that it's actually like an infinite kind of resolution. Like if you wanted to do something like this, you know, it will be like an 8K texture that you had to load, but at the same time, you can like you know modify it in real time but, and do, do whatever with it. Is there another example of this? Let's see. Maybe this one. Yeah, interestingly, like this is actually like you know this texture is being generated every frame, and it seems like to be pretty performant. And the same thing, like the you know resolution is infinite. Um, so that's pretty much what we have so far for like the web GPU work. Like it's still. I don't think it's ready for um, production at this point, like, but we're trying, we're getting pretty close to that. I think for the end of the year, we're, we're aiming to, like, to be able to replace it and recommend people to start using it. Uh, from the WebExR Web side, like, uh, the API ha hasn't really changed. Like, right now, we're just waiting for devices to catch up. Like, we, worked these, we did most of this stuff for, you know, on the Daydream era. Like, then they stopped things, and like, now it's, people are sent to the devices. The API is pretty much just you know, on, the, on the render, you enable XR, and then you, you are, have access. To, you are, then you have all the code internally to render for each eye. Um, at this point, it's supposed like the main two platforms like MetaQuest, and also like yesterday they were announcing that for fall 2024, the Vision Pro with the Vision OS 2, they're going to actually have like WebXR enabled um, by default. So now we have like two platforms. It's only going to be VR, but uh, it's good. It's exciting. Some of the projects that people have been doing uh, so far, like you know, at this point, like we have like uh, hand tracking is like kind of a, some, something that it was always there. So this is a good example of that. And one of the new extensions that we've been doing working on is like a mesh detection. So now you, you can have like a, a geometry of your whatever you have, like of what you see. But it's something that basically the, the browser gives you. Like you can have a, whatever you are, it can give you a 3D geometry. It's not something that the website can scan. And also diff sensing, uh, which basically is something that in this case you have a depth map of the scene that you're looking at. So in this case, um, you didn't see like the ball went behind, well behind the the screen, so you're able to include things. Uh, you're able to include like three D objects on your scene with whatever you have around you. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. This is all the work that we have done so far.